Taiwan, a country I'm proud to say I'm from, in my career as a media entrepreneur. I've spoken to movers and shakers here who make global headlines. But what I'm most excited about are the up and coming forces of my generation. They're young, they're creative, they dare to defy the status quo. Follow me as I meet emerging leaders of Taiwan who lift us, who inspire us, who are changing the world, starting in Taiwan. This is Game Changers with Emily Waiwu. Our game changer today, she's a fresh face in Taiwanese politics. Her name is Miao Boya. When she was 31 years old, she was elected into city council in the capital city of Taipei in a historically conservative district, and she's continued to win. It's extremely difficult to be elected as a political representative here in Taiwan. Of the 23 million people here, only roughly about 1,000 get to be political representatives. 10% sit in the national parliament, and the rest, 900 of them, they are city councillors. Representing the people, it's a great job. It's an honorable job. But it's also a job that you tend to stay on if you get elected. Now this means there's very little slim chance for young and up and coming aspiring politicians. And that's where our game changer today, Miao Boya, comes in. She started her career as a social activist and is now a rising star in her class of young politicians. And she's from a third party. And so let's meet our game changer today, Miao Boya. Hey, welcome. Hi, Emily. So good to see you. Nice to meet you. So in your district, which is a historically uh, politically conservative district, you have about half a million um, voters in your district. Yes. When you first ran as a 31-year-old um, councillor to be um, in 2018, you won, you were the top five of that race, which had almost 30 contenders. Uh, 25. You had the highest vote out of anybody who was not of the dominant political party at the time. Yeah. And then four years later, in the most recent election, yes. you came in second in this very difficult district. As you said, uh, it's extremely difficult for a young person like me, and I'm, I was born in a very normal family, so I don't have any political backgrounds. And um, I joined a very small party, Social Democrat. So yes, it looks like a miracle or it looks like extremely difficult for a candidate like me to be in the second place. But I, I think it is because uh, my dictionary, Da An Wen Shan, is, as you said, it's conservative, but it's very diverse. Mm. Uh, there are some uh, maybe young people also in my dictionary and uh, people want a new face in politics in a third party. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Taiwan's election system is favor for the two-party system, but we're trying to do something different. So I joined the Social Democrat Party and trying to form the third party, and that that would attract some young people. Uh, and also, I think I'm very lucky because uh, my voters are willing to um, look at what I'm doing and they're willing to listen to hmm. our ideologies. Some of our campaign platform is about the young generations, the uh, labor rights and gender equality, yeah. and of course the uh, Taiwan independence. Before you ran for office, uh, you were in the NGOs and yes. the civic society. Um, you were very active. Um, did that experience inspire you to launch a different type of campaign? I run not totally different, but slightly different. Uh -huh. Because I use social media okay. platform as my campaign platform. Because um, in Taiwan, joining a campaign can cost lots of money. Yeah. And I don't have <laughs> lots of money. So I was trying to use the you know, uh, Facebook, um, Instagram maybe, uh, YouTube, uh, right now Twitter. Mm. Uh, as my platform. And before I became a political candidate, I was a, a social activist, as you said. And in 2014, there's a sunflower movement in Taiwan. Basically, it's a Congress occupation. Mm. I was one of the par participants. And after that, uh, I think it's time to 
bring some something new into mm. politics. So that's the reason why I became a politician. Yeah, let, let's bring that back a little bit to 2014 with the Sunflower Movement, which is a kind of the watershed and coming out um, student activism moment for Taiwan. Um, when students occupied the national parliament for about one month calling for um, the stopping of a trade agreement with China. Yes. What did you feel at the time that was so unique and important that propelled you to launch your political career? I think that's because um, some form of movement is the largest, it's not only a protest, I think, it's the largest social event yeah. in Taiwan history ever. You know, we have 500,000 people on the street and call for the government to stop the trade deal with China. And also we want a constitution reform. When I was in that movement, I feel very vibrant energy, mm. a new vibrant energy in our democracy. Uh, the trade deal was stopped. Mm. But the constitutional reform, no, it is it, not come yet, and um, the other arguments are totally ignored mm. by the government. Mm -hmm. you know, after the Sunflower Movement, and in 2015, mm -hmm. uh, former President Ma Ying-jeou even go to Singapore and mm. shake hands with uh, China President Xi, Xi right? Xi Jinping, yeah. yeah. Ma ying totally ignored hmm. the, the Sunflower Movement, even it's the largest social movement in history ever. So I think it's necessary to have a reform in politics, okay. because the social movement has its limit. In 2014-15, there's lots of people anticipate that someone, someone to do the <laughs> political reform, right? If everyone is saying, why is no one doing that? So uh, I want to stop the complaining mm -hmm. and uh, be, the, be the doer, not the complainer. So yeah, I, I, <laughs> I took a shot. <laughs> you were working on social justice, um, yes. LGBT rights, women's rights, but also to abolish the death penalty, which yes. is a huge topic in Taiwan. Um, Very controversial. But that was where you came from, right? That yes. and sunflowers. But then to launch a public campaign, was that all intimidating? To going to up against very large forces? I'm very used to face the controversial issues. Huh. When I was a social activist, I was trained to explain uh, what's our idea mm -hmm. and uh, why we want to do this. And not only the death penalty issue, but also judicial reform, labor rights, and LGBT rights, and uh, women rights, etc. So it's not very intimidating for me to be different, but I, have to, I do have to be very patient to explain again, again, and again. Why, why, why do I want to abolish the death penalty? Or why do I want to legalize gay marriage? Or why do I want to you know, um, stop the nuclear power plant? Mm -hmm. Or why do I want to argue for Taiwan independence? Mm -hmm. And it's all very controversial, but our society is keeping move on within the debate. Yeah. Would you say that the fact that you're so successful in this very conservative district, it does mean that the society is changing, is moving forward? I think it means that the young generations don't have to be afraid to face the challenges. And we have a chance to change people's mind. I believe that people can be persuaded. Yeah. Uh, even that we might be very different, yeah. but we can find our, our common points, our common ideas, or common interests. And you know, politics is, is like uh, trying to find a common interest in very different groups. So uh, I was trained as a social activist. I learned how to express myself and I learned how to communicate. And after that, I trained myself as a politician. So I learned how to you know, work with people, work with very different people, and try to find our common interests or our common ideas. 
from very diverse community. It's incredible. It's the, the making of a, uh, of a young politician. All right, let's, uh, let's take a break here. Yes. And uh, when we come back, I want to ask you about your early influences as a student activist in high school. Hey, welcome back to Game Changers with Emily Waiwu. This is where I sit down with cool young hip people of Taiwan who are doing amazing things in the world. Today, we've been sitting here with Miao Bu Ya, a fresh face in Taiwanese politics, a dynamic force that I'm sure you'll keep seeing in Taiwanese politics. Now, Bu Ya, or Miao. Yeah. So we spoke to some of your, uh, what we call Xue Mei, which is your, the alums from your high school. Yes. And um, you're, you're quite an inspiration to them. So I want to bring us back. Um, you went to the first senior girls high school, which is the, the best um, school for young women here in Taiwan. So in Taiwan, you have to wear uniform to school. There's about four sets of uniform. A formal set, uh. and an athletic set. A winter set, and a summer set. The school dictated, told you what to wear during which season. So if the school said it's cold. Everybody had to wear a long sleeve. And you partitioned against this and led kind of a student rebellion to get the school to overturn this. Tell us about this. I'm arguing for that uh, students can have the right to choose which uniform they want to wear. You know, I'm not fighting for abolish the uniform. I just want that we have the right to choose whether I, I want to wear the skirts or the, the pants. Uh, I was born in 1987. That was a year that we abolished the martial, martial law. law. Uh, but uh, the society still were very conservative. Um, so when I was born as a girl, raised <laughs> as a girl, but mm -hmm. I don't like that. Mm. So I don't like to wear skirts since I was very little. But I have to wear skirt maybe half year, you know, yeah. because of the uniform system. Yeah. So when I was in high school, I was 17, 18 then, I thought that's ridiculous because I am adult. You know, 18 is <laughs> basically is adult, uh, but I cannot decide what type of uniform do I need to wear. But also the school is right next to the presidential office. So what I hear is that there's a big emphasis on looking proper, um, acting proper, proper, elegant, yeah. and uh, you know, uh, we, we, we were asked to be very, very disciplined. Yeah. I will use the word discipline because it's a um, tradition left by the Chiang Kai-shek government. Basically, they used the military system in high schools. So everyone has the same hairstyle and wear the same uniform and walking in the yeah. same pace. <laughs> Just like, yeah, in the military camp, yeah. in campus. So I can feel that it's not right. Yeah, because I born in a freedom, mm. freedom time in Taiwan. So um, I took a chance that uh, when I was 18, uh, our school have the new principal. And at that time, our government has a new policy. Our Ministry of Education have a new order tell every high school that you cannot punish students just because the uniform issues. Mm. So I just grabbed the chance and asked our principal whether we can have a little reform that we still have the uniform system and we just let the students have the right to choose which uniform do you want. And I think the one of um, maybe the key of the success is that I persuade the principal, and the principal persuade their uh, her staffs. Fast track ten years later, so there was another protest from students also related to uniforms. Now they wanted to mix the sets. Yes. And that was a problem for the school. And you went back and advocated and supported the students. I think. Uh, about student activists, the most important part is to, is to empower the young generation, no matter what kind of topic they choose. The point is they have to learn how to be an activist and how to address themselves and how to persuade 
the people have different ideas and how to uh, explain to the society uh, what we want and why we want this. It's a very important way to empower the young students to be a citizen yeah, in, in the process, no matter how they success or not, but in the process, they can be very, very different mm. from you know, the disciplined students. And maybe as you just described, the rebellion. The rebellion is the, you know, the nature of the social progress. Rebellion as the nature of social progress. Yes. If we don't have the rebellion, then mm. we were just satisfied with everything. <laughs> and uh, we accept everything that exists and we don't want to change anything. Then the social progress will stop. I know that the young generations need support yeah. from older generations. <laughs> and yeah. I am the older generations to them. Really, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. so um, I'm just trying to be the adult mm. that I admire when I was young. You need that sense of rebellion when pushing for reform and social change. Once you're in office, once you've been elected, does that strategy change? What is that shift like in mindset? Basically, I took myself as a key point of communication. Mm. Uh, I, I met different social groups, different people, different communities, and they all have different ideas and they all want different things. And I try to find their common interest. We can combine different groups of people and trying to make something change. So communicate and maybe a little bit compromise and progress. Communicate a little bit of, of compromising and then that leads to the progress. Yes, and okay. so that's my strategy now as a politician because it's a little bit different from uh, social activists and politicians. Yeah. And social activists can be very uh, radical. As a social activist, my job is to call for change. But as a politician, our job is to make the change happen. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm still learning. I should mm. still be radical mm -hmm. in ideology, mm -hmm. but I should be very pragmatic in you know, what I'm actually doing and why I communicate with the conservatives. For young aspiring, whether activists or politicians, for a young person who just wants to see change, what advice do you have for them? I think we have to remember that the society is, uh, it will not change itself. It have to have some people working very hard for the change. So if you want to see any change happen, please, just to do something that you can do. Now, you don't have to be a full-time social activist, but you can, you can do many of little things in your daily life. For example, you can post some, something on your social networks and tell your friends or your family what are you caring for, uh, why are you caring so much, uh, or you can just um, maybe communicate with your friends and tell them something new. They might have noticed that, but you noticed that. Yeah. Any, any kind of issue that you care about, uh, you know, women rights, labor mm -hmm. rights, mm -hmm. public housing, anything you're interested in. I think it's very, very important for us, especially Taiwan is a very young, vibrant democracy. And actually, we are facing lots of threats and stress by a foreign government. So we do need the young generation involved, engaged in public efforts. I think that's the most important part that Taiwan can keep being a vibrant democracy. Be the change, be the doer, yes. um, see the change and do it. Yes. I think this is super inspiring. Thank you. Before you go, I have a final question. Uh, this is a question we ask everybody, yes. which is out of your accomplishments, how much was given to you versus how much did you have to fight for? Um, first of all, I don't know if I have any accomplishment because um, Taiwan is still facing lots of challenges. Mm. All I want 
is to create a society that everyone can have a chance to find their own happiness. I know that I haven't success <laughs> because uh, we still have lots of things to do. Yeah, actually, I just want to build. Mm. I just want to build a very a, a good environment mm. for my maybe for my sister, for my sister's child, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and for my sister maybe she'll have grandson, granddaughters. And if I can do that, I can make the the society be better a little mm. bit, a little bit every day. And maybe I can have some achievement <laughs> yeah. in my political career. For example, if someday I become a president, but I can not do anything good for the society, mm. it will be meaningless. But when I was just a social activist, I believe that I am doing good things every day and trying to push the society a small step ahead. Hmm. Even it's very very small step, but I, I I think yes that's my goal. So in my political career, my goal is to push the society better better, and in every day. And I want to be the yeah I want to be the change myself. Seems like again and again you've been finding the perfect moment, talking to the right people, and to enact that change. Um, and I am so sure you will continue to inspire young aspiring politicians and activists in Taiwan and, and abroad. Thank you. I think it's the nature of Taiwanese. Yeah. You know, yeah. If you look at Taiwan on the world map, we are very, very close to, <laughs> I think maybe it's uh, one of the biggest dictatorship in mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. But we are also the most vibrant democracy in this region. I was elected in a very conservative community, but uh, lots of my ideas are seem to be very progressive. It's our nature as a Taiwanese. We just yeah. struggle in the mug, and uh, <laughs> we are trying our best to, to find uh, the path of survival. All these 400 years in Taiwan history, we are doing this every day. Yeah. So um, I think it's not very strange that Taiwan can create miracles or create something that no one ever thought of because it's our nature. We are a we're challenger. We're challenger. We're yeah. rebellious. And thank so, you so much. Thank you. And that's all the time we have for today. Uh, Miao Bo Ya, an incredibly dynamic force in politics in Taiwan a fresh face that I'm sure international audience you will continue to hear about in the news and in the making um, of Taiwan, in the future of Taiwan. Yes. So now, if you're also an aspiring politician or if you're also a young politician, please get in touch with Miao Bo Ya. Thank you. And as for me, I'm Emily Wai Wu. You can find me on my socials. You're watching Taiwan Plus. Follow and subscribe to all our channels. We'll see you next time. <laughs>